please stand and sing with us. this morning and to those of you watching on virtual church thank you for joining us why don't you take 90 seconds text somebody who's who's on your mind maybe even somebody who you know from southwest florida let them know that you are thinking of them and if you're here in the room would you greet someone new and introduce yourself
Well, good morning, Georgiana. You all can have a seat this morning. It is a really, really nice and full morning. If you see some folks who are still coming in uh, looking for seats, if you'll kind of condense and get to know somebody next to you, maybe that you don't know already, and, and allow some room for some folks to, to sit in. If you're like on the outsides, if you'll kind of maybe head towards the wall a little bit and allow some uh, seats along the aisle, that'd be great. So uh, it is so good to be in worship in here. Amen? Amen. 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 So my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is so good to be in worship with you all today. Uh, a few things going on in the life of the church that you just need to know about that I am just thrilled to announce today. Uh, one is just this enormous bit of good news. Are you ready for some good news this morning? So last Sunday evening, we had this amazing thing called pie auction. Did you make it to pie auction? Was it awesome, right? Did you have a good time? So if you were there uh, live last Sunday, you heard us announce a total that was a little bit premature. So if you were there Sunday night, we, we announced uh, that we had raised $78,000 uh, on that evening, but you all kept coming through. You were faithful. You were generous. The checks kept coming in uh, last week. And so the grand total, now if you've seen this on social media, you already know, so spoiler, but the grand total that we raised through Pi Auction ended up at just over $96,000. Yeah. So, so one thing you may not be aware of is that Georgiana gives all of that away. And one thing that was news to me is we don't even write off our expenditures for that evening. We, we, don't, we don't take anything out to pay for just the cost of the rental and the food that night. Everything uh, goes away, and it, specifically it goes to an orphanage called Seeds in His Garden, an orphanage in Africa that specifically reaches out to special needs orphans in Africa. So they are going to receive a check for nearly $100,000 coming up really soon, and that's all because of your generosity. So one more time, let's, let's give God praise for all that he did. Uh, something else coming up that we want you to be aware of, especially men in the room. You may notice I have this awesome shirt that says M2M on it. That is our new men's ministry, or ministry to men, I should say. And we are going to have a kickoff event on October 14th, which features axe throwing. Because when you relaunch men's ministry, you've got a lot of wood to chop when you do that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be here all week. Thank you. That's true. My office is right over there, so I am here all week. So on October 14th, the Friday night, we are going to relaunch our men's ministry. So at 5 p.m., you can come as early as 5 p.m. for some axe throwing. Uh, we're going to have dinner at 6, and then at 7 p.m., we're going to be right back in here to talk about the vision for the future of ministry to men here at Georgiana. So, of course, we have a QR code for this if you want to register for that. Uh, let us know you're coming. We, we need to know how much food to buy, uh, make sure we're prepared. So you can go ahead and scan that now, or you can get that uh, information out on the welcome desk as you walk out a little bit later on uh, after service. So men, make sure that you are aware of that. Uh, also, so we have uh, worship team auditions that are coming up uh, here in the, in the next few weeks. October 23rd after the 11.15 a.m. service. If you would like to audition for the worship band, we would love to have you do that. October 23rd after the 11.15 a.m. service. So we've had some really, really talented young people, for whatever reason, think it's important for them to go off to college. I don't understand that. But they're going to go away uh, and be out to college, so, um, so we have uh, some openings for our worship team, so we'd love to have you audition for that. So October 23rd, uh, 11, after the 11.15 uh, service, we would love to have you there. So um, also, we are returning to supporting uh, our Cambridge Elementary School in the classroom to support the Cambridge teachers in the classroom. And so if you want to register to do that, that would be awesome. This is one of those things that COVID kind of derailed for a few years, and we're back to supporting our elementary school, Cambridge and Coco, uh, in the classrooms. And so if you want to volunteer for that, we'd love to have you there. Um, one more thing. So Pumpkin Patch is coming out. Are you excited for Pumpkin Patch this year? Right? Woo! Um, so Pumpkin Patch is coming. We have a tentative date of October 16th for pumpkins to be delivered. Uh, and, and again, if you are new to Georgiana, you just need to know we get a bunch of pumpkins delivered here, and they're for us to give away 
to our community. So we don't take any money there for us to give away. And if you are from here and you want a pumpkin, you are cordially invited to go somewhere else and buy that pumpkin. The pumpkins that are here are to give away to our community. And so we would love to have you all sign up to just work that patch over the last the last half of October. And so we still have, if my math is correct, 35 slots to fill. Uh, and so if you want to sign up to work pumpkin patch, that would be awesome to have you there to do that. Uh, and then last thing, today is Communion Sunday, so we hope that you're ready for that. It's a special time in the life of the church. And every Communion Sunday, we give away 10% of our offering. Whatever we take in, we give 10% of that away. We tithe that to a ministry that we want to support. Uh, this Sunday, we were supporting Shema Ministries. These are local businessmen in the community uh, who are helping individuals and organizations in need. This was started by Georgiana's own Dave Campbell, and so we're going to be supporting Shema Ministries uh, today through our Communion Offering. Uh, and so the very, very last thing, we want to make sure um, that you are aware of how we are responding to the hurricane, Hurricane Ian. Uh, we certainly dodged a bullet here in Brevard, and we're so thankful for that. But Southwest Florida was not so fortunate. And so I want to invite Corky up to talk about how we are responding to Hurricane Ian. As is the custom of this church, uh, anytime that there is a crisis of any magnitude, but certainly of this magnitude, you know your church does not sit on its hands. So on Friday, I began to have communication with the elder board about an immediate response that Georgiana could have, and they unanimously voted to send uh, relief aid uh, to two organizations that are already on the ground doing work uh, in the Fort Myers area. So we will send $10,000 to Mercy Chefs, uh, who is providing hot home-cooked meals uh, to literally thousands of people, and they'll do that for the next period of time. Uh, we also sent $10,000 to Convoy of Hope, which provides a different kind of need. They're providing more of the tangible things that you might need, water for sure, uh, blankets, uh, you know, uh, tarps, these kind of things. Convoy of Hope is there. Uh, we have had a great partnership with both these ministries and are excited to just come alongside them in what is the most devastating storm, I think, to hit Florida in many, 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 many years. Uh, Didi and I have been blessed over the last 30 years. We vacation, our summer vacation time is in, always in Sanibel, Captiva area, and it is unrecognizable uh, right now. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I want to also share that Mike and Kelly took five pallets of water over uh, just this past Friday, and we're grateful for them. Liz and Roman Poole in our church also uh, are over there. They took their motor home, and they're just going to stay, and they're going to help Mercy Chefs for a little bit. And then Luke Karg uh, picked up a uh, front-end loader, a forklift, <laughs> from Orlando and then drove it to Fort Myers for Mercy Chefs. So these are people in your church uh, that are helping. We are connected with a couple of churches down there. We had somebody else give us the name of another church uh, that's working down there. We're going to continue to monitor this situation. So I want to say thank you because you're faithful with the tithe. It allows us to respond immediately, right? So thank you for that. Uh, and we'll continue to evaluate and see what's going on. This is a long haul. Nothing in Southwest Florida is getting fixed right away. So uh, just know that this church recognizes when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. And I know that you all were as devastated as we were just watching it unfold. And so fortunate, how fortunate we feel today that we're in God's house with the air running, everything in place. And so we're thankful for that. So with that in mind, Caroline's going to come and pray for us. And so I invite her to do that. Again, just from my heart to yours, thank you uh, for your faithfulness. It allows us to be as generous as we are. Thanks, Caroline. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is with us, and you are the great I am. You are the God who was, who is, who is to come. And yet, though you did not need us, you created us, and you love us, and you went through great lengths to just help us from ourselves, from our own sin. You rescued us from the pit we were in. We cannot ever show enough appreciation to you for all that you are and for what you've done for us. 
God, this morning our hearts are just so heavy for those who are in southwest Florida and throughout the middle of the state who are just going through such a difficult time because of the hurricane. And we pray that you would just provide for them, walk with them, reveal yourself to them as they're just going through such a hard time. And I pray, Lord, that you would just give them the ability to sense your presence and to know it, to feel that you're there, feel your spirit, and see your hand move in their life like they never have before. And that ultimately that they would be drawn near to you. And Lord, we just pray for those who are um, providing aid, wisdom. We pray for strength for them. We pray for the resources that are needed to be um, generously given. And we just pray for comfort for those who are experienced loss. And most of all, God, we do want to pray for salvation. We pray that this would just spark a revival in that area, that people would bow them, their hearts to you that are lost. God, we love you so much. And Help us this week to look outside of ourselves so that we can love and serve those around us. And help us to remember the reason why we do that so that we can share Jesus with them. Amen. Amen, church. Would you stand back to your feet this morning as we continue to sing to our God? on 
when he returns I will not waver I am secure To this I'm anchored Of this I'm sure That he is faithful That he is good Yes, he is faithful stand on. So God, let us place our hope and our trust solely in you. And God, we so desperately just yearn to be more like you. So as we open your word this morning, God, would you just speak through Pastor Corky to transform us into your image. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and all God's people say. Amen, amen. Hey, can we thank the band as we sit? This is these guys. And- I, uh, I, do, I do hope some of you talented people that can sing and play will come out and audition and uh, help us grow the band. Listen, I need to handle just a little house business before we get to the Word of God. Uh, I just want to echo what Ryan said about last Sunday night. Uh, you know, it feels a little bit like uh, the storm robbed us of being able to celebrate with joy the amazing night we had last Sunday. It felt like it was three weeks ago, first of all. Uh, but we had an incredible pie auction, and I, it's a tribute to this church and its generosity, and I just want to personally say thank you. I also want to thank the trustees that came out Friday morning to help get the church cleaned up. They were on it, about 15, 20 folks that just knocked it out, and we're grateful for Dave Winston and all his hard work that he puts into getting the place put back together. But we're, we're just thankful for those men and women who came out and got it cleaned up quickly and you know, one of the things I discovered in the last few days, I go to the gym regularly. I know it doesn't look like it, but I go regularly. And, you know, there is not a single piece of equipment in the gym that simulates raking. <laughs> I got up Saturday morning and hurt in places I didn't even know that I owned. Man, it was bad. And uh, lastly, with just a great sense of humility, I want to say thank you for the sign that's out front and just your kindness and your thoughtfulness. And thank you and I. Um, we're so grateful to be your pastor and your clergy family, and, uh, but I do want to say this. Any good thing that has happened around here is because God has blessed me to be surrounded by the most amazing staff in the world, and so we're, we're really blessed. And so, so anyway, all right. Mark's not up there to say it, but we got wood to chop, so let's go to work. You know what it's like if I haven't preached in two weeks, so here we go, here we go. So Super grateful for Ryan and Janice and the way they uh, launched our Oneness series on unity. Ryan reminded us two weeks ago that in order for oneness to happen, our kingdom purpose has to trump our personal desire for power, privilege, and preference. Let me say that again. In order for oneness to happen, our kingdom purpose has to trump our personal desire for power, privilege, and preference. And then Janice came along last week with a beautiful sermon and she reminded us that our oneness in hope is our witness to a broken world that is in desperate need of hope, that we are the living witness of hope, that hope goes before our introduction of Jesus Christ in most people's lives. So today I want to focus on what it means to be one heart, not necessarily one mind, but actually one in heart, the wellspring of the Holy Spirit living inside of us and what that means to be united together. In both the book of Mark and the book of Matthew, Mark 3, Matthew 12, Jesus says these words, 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. At least according to Jesus, this unity thing is a big honking deal in here and a big honking deal at your house, right? This is, you know, we raise our children and say, listen, we're going to do it together. Life is together. Ryan made it clear a couple weeks ago that we live in a world of separators, alienators, and dividers who literally go through life looking to destroy others by division. This act is an act of evil, and these evil people are having a field day in our country right now. They're just running rampant, creating division everywhere. I've been studying the book of Jude the last three or four months. It's a very small book. It's a short study. (laughs) Here's what it says. He says, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. In other words, what he's saying is there was this thing I wanted to write you about. However, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. He says, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign Lord. These kind of warnings run throughout this book, uh, throughout the book. Jude is 24 verses of a wake-up call. Jude goes on to say right at the very end, it says, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ were told. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who will divide you, who follow mere mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit in them. I'm just telling you, the book of Jude could easily be written for the modern American church. It's incredible. It is 24 verses of wake up, O sleeper, arise and shine, for Christ is on you. It's a wake-up call. So if I can be completely transparent for a minute, lose my mind just for a second, I need to tell you this morning something some of you know about me, some of the leaders know about me. I am a unity freak. I am a freak about this idea of unity. The biblical mandate for oneness is a huge, huge core value for me. I think it comes from seeing destructive effects of disunity in churches, in businesses, in sports teams, and in families. If you live inside this kind of brokenness long enough, then your passion will boil to see it never touch the people or the things you love, because you know how destructive it is. As your under-shepherd of the great shepherd, it is my mission to protect us from the tentacles of disunity with my last breath. I will not let anything come between us. Listen, there are things that we will not agree 100% on, but there should be some non-negotiable core values that unite us in ways that cause us to look past these many differences that the world has. So I say to you this morning, with all sincerity, if you're a vegetarian or a pescatarian or a flexitarian or you're a straight-up keto carnivore, I do not care. (laughs) I want to know, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind? And do you love your neighbor? Do you love the Seminoles, the Knights, the Gators, (laughs) the Canes, the Panthers for Tom Brandon, the Bulls, the Ospreys, the Owls? Every year I do this list, I leave somebody off the list, and I get an email. Ah, you forgot about the uh, aardvarks down in South Florida. (laughs) Whatever your team is, I don't care. I really don't care, but do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and do you love your neighbor as yourself? This is what I'm focused on. All the other stuff are kingdom unessentials. There is no shortage of things that we disagree about. I think we can all do that. I mean, even close friends disagree about things. Think about it. We could create a conflict about who does and does not like Brussels sprouts. And people can be passionate about it. For 60 years, people have been trying to get me to eat Brussels sprouts, right? I was, I was going to put a pie chart together about Brussels sprouts, but Janice promised we were done with pie charts. So, Seriously, seriously, church, until two years ago, you could count me among the Brussels sprout haters in the world. I thought they were Satan's vegetable, uh, kind, of a, kind of a bitter, dwarfed cabbage that was picked way too soon. Right, like somebody lost patience in the garden. Like, 
I'm ready for cabbage, so we'll just cut this little thing off, right? You know, right? It just was stupid to me. And they're bitter. They're, you know, right? So about two years ago, we go to dinner with some friends at a restaurant in Melbourne. And the waitress is talking about how special the Brussels sprouts are. And I must have gone off on Brussels sprouts. Like, I was like, and she goes, here's the deal. I think they're so good that if you'll order them and you don't like them, I'll pay for them. That's a pretty good deal. Because if I don't like them, everybody else that likes them at the table is getting them, right? We're still getting them for free. I thought this was a good deal. I love them. <laughs> it was like an epiphany. I had an epiphany. It was incredible. Now, now to be clear, they were cooked in bacon, butter, and brown sugar. <laughs> you know? All right? <laughs> Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, right? Just last night, we had some dinner with friends. He made some amazing, Mark, he made some amazing Brussels sprouts. They were just incredible. Now count me among the Brussels sprout enthusiasts, right? I can talk to you about that. Cauliflower, ain't happening, ain't happening. Again, again, I could list, I could list hundreds of things that we could get wound up in disagreement about. Sports teams cause people to lose their minds. Like one of you last Sunday, I'm going to try not to look at you, Walked in the room doing the tomahawk chop. Right? Too soon, bro. Too soon. Right? Right? I'm just saying, right? You know, little humility goes a long way. You know, you don't see me every Sunday going, oh, you know. You know, you just got to dial it back a little bit. Right? And then there's politics. Oh, oh. There's social justice issues. There is worship music styles. There is the way we do communion, believe it or not. Not everybody thinks this is a good way to do communion. There's global warming or non-global. There's reality TV. Why do we have reality TV? We have a show called Naked and Afraid. Like I want to see some chubby guy without any clothes on, wandering around dirty, getting eaten by bugs, trying to survive. Who cares? It's not real life. You're there because you chose to be there. That makes you an idiot. All right? But man, people watch that show, it's, it's like 12th season. I'm like, seriously, what is wrong with people? And of course, believe it or not, we still have a few COVID-related conflicts. So you see, there's all manner of things that we can dis disagree about, even Brussels sprouts. The Apostle Paul made a radical statement in his letter to the Galatian churches. He was bold, so bold as to say, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you have been baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one. In Christ Jesus, radical. In, most, in our mostly egalitarian society, a statement like this just roll past us. We read it and we don't think it's a big deal. But can you imagine the circumstantial differences between a Jew and a Gentile in the first century when it's written? I mean, there's so many places to disconnect. They have, it, these issues plague the early church, these disconnects. What food could we eat? Who prepared it? Where did it come from? Did it, you know, was it altar? I was sacrificed on an altar, all this kind of stuff. And then there was this issue of circumcision. If you were a new con convert to Christianity and you were like, hey, that's a big honking decision, right? You're a grown man, man, that's a big deal, right? They had this conflict, right? But what Paul is saying Neither matter, only Christ. Can you imagine the circumstantial differences between slaves and free people? Like the difference that one is in chains and one is not. One moves around uninhibited, one does not. One controls their future, one does not. These are big disconnects. And Paul says, you know what? Neither matters, only Christ, only Christ. And then he said, there is neither male nor female. We still really haven't gotten this one right in the culture we're living in, right? <laughs> Women in the first century thought, let me get this straight. I can't vote. I can't speak. I can't lead. But you're saying we're all one? Yeah, right. <laughs> right? What are you, nuts? What are you, nuts? This is so incredibly radical. Paul is saying that we are not defined by our circumstances. And for that matter, in my opinion, nor are we defined by our pronouns. Amen? Amen. We are defined by Jesus Christ the author of salvation, the first fruit of life. In my opinion, we have got to quit letting our circumstances define who we are. We are defined by who Christ is. Our identity is in Christ. 
I think part of the problem is that we choose saneness because it feels safe. But there is nothing in this book about safety. This is the word of God. It is not an OSHA manual. It is the word of a living God. This book is about repelling the darkness, chasing the gates of hell, confronting our sin, and declaring war on our self-dependency. Saneness is not always the same as oneness. You need to get that through our heads. Sameness is not always the same as oneness. In 1 John 3, it says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. I just think it's pretty easy these days to get led astray. The fact is, is I've seen more people led astray in the last three years by false teachers, cultural consumerism, and the whims of a wispy, blowing religion of individualism. A modern religion based on feeling good and not being obedient. More and more people are warning are ignoring these warning signs as if they don't have eternal significance, as if there are not consequences. I think we find ourselves in a messed up, mixed up, chaotic work, world plagued by sin and death, and it touches every aspect of our lives and families and communities. However, in the unparalleled prosperity of the United States of America, we can almost manage to insulate ourselves from our need for others or our need for Jesus through some sort of combination of achievement and addiction and then all of a sudden disunity just feels normal just being at conflict with somebody just feels normal we vacillate between education and entertainment in an endless quest for momentary experiences of the so-called good life turning to the gods of self-help when they seem when they seem to suit our situation and it all leads to divisive individualism that doesn't care who it hurts or what it destroys to get what it wants let that sink in. It doesn't care. So I want to share an ancient creed with you. I'm going to turn around because I discovered at the first service that without my glasses, I can't read it from the back. So, so you know this creed. If you, you can say it with me if you'd like. But I'm going to get it started. It's called the Apostles' Creed. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitted at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Written in 381 AD. You know why it's written? Because people were already starting to distort the gospel. They were coming along and just making stuff up about what it meant to be a Christian. And so the leaders of the church said, you know what? We've got to write something down that says this is actually what we believe. Here are the three main heresies that were floating around in the second and third century. The first one was Arianism, a theology that denies the divinity of Christ. Then there was Pelagianism, a theology that denies the doctrine of original sin. That essentially, it says we're all innately good and do not need a Savior, much less a Lord. And then there was Gnosticism. This was kind of a weird thing that denied that the body could ever be holy. And the only way that you could know God was in your mind. And nobody would know that you knew God because it was in your mind. And nobody could judge that. It was like Nirvana and New Age collided, you know? Here's the thing. <clears throat> These three heresies, <laughs> they're as real today as they were in the second century. They're just masquerading under cultural influences of individualism that denies the need for Jesus. You know it as you do you. You just do you. You be you. All right? Don't worry about anybody else. Doesn't matter if it hurts anybody. You just do you. This is what's happening it's creating a Christianity that is comfortable, is based on being comfortable with personal sensibilities, and it always gains traction and validation by dividing hearts. Just like then, these things are finding their way into the local church. And I'm telling you this morning, not here and never on my watch. This is why I am a unity freak, because we are so vulnerable to the slightest seed of doubt. I want us to be one heart about the virgin birth about the divinity of Christ, about the lordship of Jesus, the atonement 
of the cross for our sins, the power of the Holy Spirit, the authority of Scripture, and the call to give ourselves away. I want us to be one heart around the, the least of these that Jesus spends so much talking about. You know, the one another's, the marginalized, the hungry, the forgotten, the orphans, the widows, the unborn, the sanctity of life, the lost who are all around us. The truth is there has to be no room for divided hearts inside the kingdom of God. United hearts is what advances the kingdom. Some of us are experiencing, I believe, spiritual turmoil because we have yoked our hearts to toxic hearts and toxic systems that pull us away from Jesus and pull us away from his church. We have accepted culturally a lukewarm, watered-down faith is normal and acceptable. I've got bad news. Some are going to get to the end of the race and realize that they have compromised the great gift at the expense of popularity and people-pleasing. Church, this is why I'm passionate about unity in one heart, because it matters both now and forever. <laughs> This is not just like, oh, it's you know, not going to work for you on Tuesday. It's forever. In, in my early years of working around high-level sports teams, I saw the destructiveness of divided hearts and how easily they could divide a locker room. You know, just, it just took one, literally, one bad apple ruins the barrel kind of thing. I've been in the room where a very talented athlete was being let go, sent down, traded to another team, simply because they were dividing the team. The unity of the team was too important to risk it for the sake of talent alone. And th we see this happen all the time. Oh, you know, they're super talented. They're super destructive. They've got to go, right? So w when I became a business owner in my 20s, which I need to tell you is way too soon for anybody to own their own business. <laughs> I, was like, I would love to know then what I know now. I just, it's been crazy. Um, but I put into practice a value-based system for hiring people that I actually learned from Coach Steve Spurrier when I had a chance to work under him. I believe in hiring people based on three criteria, competency, character, and chemistry. We live in a world that primarily focuses on what? Competency. And while a lack of competency can be harmful to any organization, it can also be overcome. You can train people. You can help them become better, all these kind of things. But here's what I would tell you. Character failures and chemistry issues, these are corporate culture crushers. They just crush the culture. Another word for chemistry might be oneness. Interestingly, that these three things, same three things, are generally what gets you fired or removed from a ministry. It's the same three that got you hired. You can't do the job. You can't honor Jesus with your life. You can't honor your teammates with love and support. And failure to be one, to be all in for one another, does these get you spit out? These are my principles when I look at people. And I'm going to be really patient for a long time with some people. But you get to a point where you realize that character and chemistry cannot be compromised. In the early church, it had a zero-tolerance policy for disunity. You just go home and read Acts 5. It'll take you about four minutes. And you realize how serious it was in the early church. Interestingly, without oneness of heart, people don't feel the pressure to excel, which is competency. People aren't held accountable, which is character. And people fail to create community, which is chemistry. Trust me when I tell you, this one heart thing, it's a big deal. It matters. Now, you know I love the Bible, right? You know that I think this book is timeless. And so there's a story. God gives us a story of what disunity and the consequences it looks like. So go to Numbers in the Old Testament, early in the book. We're going to go to number 13. We're going to just look at some small pieces of it. Go to 13, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its, keyword here, leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran, all of them were leaders of the Israelites. Here are their names. And it lists them. And then it goes on to tell a story of them wandering for 40 days through the promised land. They collect some fruit. They, they bring back some pomegranates and some grapes and some other things. It's just incredible. Pick it up in verse 26. They finally come home. And it says, They came back to Moses and Aaron, the whole Israelite community in Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them, to the whole assembly, and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. 
We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Enoch there, which are like giant people. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live in the sea, near the sea, and along the Jordan. There's too many ites, is what they're saying. The ites are everywhere. <laughs> and then Caleb, Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for certainly we can do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, oh, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there were of great size. We saw Nephilim there, descendants of Enoch. We seemed like grasshoppers in their own eyes. And we looked the same to them. And pretty soon... They had divided the entire nation of Israel over this single issue of disobedience. Divided hearts led to missional disobedience, and it kept the children of Israel from the promised land for 40 years. The consequences, church, of disunity always, always ripples through community. I want you to just think about it. Invasion of personal agendas, personal fears, personal biases, they just crept in. And if you you leave them unconfronted, they will eventually divide. It's an age-old story. It's a 3,000-year-old story. Think about it. These, these are the 12 best. They're the best of the best Israel had to offer that they sent into that land, right? They're listed by name. And they allow fear to trump the power of God. Keep in mind, this is the same group of people that had seen God defeat Pharaoh, the greatest army in the land at the time. God defeated them. They had sent, sent a cloud by day, a pillar by night, just lead them. They had seen manna just fall to the ground. Breakfast, you know, like, you know, like Kellogg's in the morning, man. It just happened, right? And then there was quail, meat to eat, right? They saw water come from a rock. Seriously, what else do you need to see? Well, there's big people over there. <laughs> Better not go. <laughs> the exploratory spy mission lasted for 40 days. And then the spies returned to the wilderness camp. Can you imagine how eager everybody must have been to hear this report? We've been waiting 40 days. Where are they coming? What, what happened? What is this? And then can you imagine how consequential this report and their response would be. And they gave to Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does, man, it flows with milk and honey. And here's its fruit. They showed them the fruit. So far, so good. And then conjunction, junction happens. And we get the dreaded but. But the people who live there, they're powerful. The cities are fortified. The cities are large. We saw descendants of Enoch there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. They have more ites in the hill. Blah, blah, blah. Ite, 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 ite. Can you feel the oxygen being sucked out of that room? All the joy, all the anticipation is just gone. Listen, we do it all the time. We go from God will be faithful to fulfill his promise to some sort of TED Talk methodology where we're counting the costs on one page and counting the pros on the other. And You know, What? When God says go, it's appropriate to count the cost, but there is a vast difference between counting the cost and doing a cost-benefit analysis. I want to be very clear about something at this point. When God gives a direction or assignment, we don't determine its legitimacy or its veracity by running spreadsheets to see if it makes sense. This is lack of faith that is holding back most churches in this country. God's will and assignments rarely make sense and in the world's way of making sense of things. I give you example one, the pie auction. (laughs) We must determine to obey first before we even get the assignment. Then it's not a question of if we will obey, but how we will execute our predetermined obedience. We just act on it. There will be plenty of time to count the cost, and there must be, it must be counted at some point. But that said, we never count the cost to determine if we can afford to do it or not, Or if we have what it takes, there's zero faith in this approach. None. Perhaps one of the biggest signs something is God's will is that we know we can't afford to do it. (laughs) Or we know we can't do it on our own. Or we know God's going to need to show up in a big way. I give you Gideon, example two. Right? Most of the effort and energy to do the will of God that I have seen in part of my life in the institutional, denominational church has been done in God's name but in man's calculus. It's been governed more by accountants than apostles, 
It's been run more by best practices than bold prophets. Good work can happen this way. Sure, it has happened. I'm just not sure we should be calling it God's work. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be doing it if it's not God's work. As, as word spread this week about, you know, the pie auction, what happened, I heard from a number of pastors within my denomination that just kind of emailed and texted and want to know if it was true. Have we raised $90,000 selling pies? I said, and a few cakes. <laughs> a few cakes. There's, there's a cake mixed in there somewhere. I think we did all right with some cakes. Here's what they, they all to the person said to them. Not my accountability partners, not Titus, not Scott, none of them. My literally just some pastors in our denomination said to me, did y'all, did y'all decide to take some of it off the top and keep some back? I mean, that's a large amount of money. Did you decide to keep back some for your storehouse? Really? Are you kidding me? There's no faith in this. It is to shave a blessing intended for orphans to create a sense of security for us in a first world country. I will never be a part of that. That we're going to say, oh, it was more than we thought it was going to be, so we should take some and keep it for ourselves. Who does that? But this this is the thinking. We need to remember that we serve a God that defeats armies and Big places because he blew a trumpet. Come on. Can I get an amen? I mean, seriously. Like, what are we thinking? This disunity proves so seriously costly. And you want to know why I take it seriously? Here's why I take it so seriously. It costs their leader a chance to go into the promised land. It costs their leader a chance. Trust me, I'm on this unity thing. Nothing comes between us, and I mean nothing. We are in it together. I believe that God's vision for us always leads to God's provision for us. And you need to know I will defend us against any separator, divider, or peddlers of watered-down gospel to the very last moment of my life. The enemy wants the church to either be cemeteries or insane asylums, dead people or crazy people. The enemy wants to divide the church. And crush its mission. We should want a church guided by the Holy Spirit. Moving with the power, courage, and conviction of that. Go where he goes. Live where he lives. The Spirit desires us to move as one. The favor of God follows those who walk in unity. You want to know why God's favor is upon us? Because we as a church have decided that we're going to walk in unity. And nothing comes into this room to divide us. We can argue in the courtyard about anything. But not in this room. God's hand is on us. The hand and favor of God follows those who walk in unity. So listen, people have a tendency to remember all the ups and downs in life, the highs and the lows, the giving up and the pressing on, the hard pressed on every side realities, the perplexing conundrums, the withering persecution, the struck down disappointments, the dire resignation leading to the altar of relinquishments. But that is not our reality. We are not crushed. We are not despairing. We are not abandoned. We are not destroyed. Our unity of heart declares not today, Satan. Every time we gather in this room, we declare with our lives in one heart that we are in it together till Jesus comes back. In it together. In here, we worship one God, one Lord, one hope, one love, and he wants us to do it all with one heart. We're going to disagree about some things, but none of them should be about the promise-keeping Lord of the universe. Listen, I'm saying to you this morning, I have one king, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. I have one allegiance, and that is to the kingdom of God. I am not divided in my loyalties. I am not divided in my love for you, the church. I am not divided in the mission and vision God has given us here, and I won't let anything divide us. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's fascinating to me when you study the Last Supper that Jesus goes to the table knowing that there was a separator, a divider, an alienator sitting at the table, that he had come to divide, to create tension, to make something he wanted to see happen. And Jesus, with all the grace imaginable, just moves right forward, doesn't blink, takes a piece of bread, gives thanks for it, breaks it, 
and said, this is my body which is given for you. My body. My body has to be broken in order for all of you to be one. That's huge. That's so significant. Jesus' body has to be broken in order for us to be one. To us to be unified around one thing. Jesus going to the cross. After the supper was over, he took a cup of wine. He gave thanks. He said, this is the blood of my new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Because, folks, we got a problem. We have a sin problem. And we need God's grace and his love to flow over us in ways that allow us to feel redeemed and loved in the way that God wants us to based on sacrificing his son for us. This is what this means. So even with a separator at the table, Jesus did not blink. He knew that what was about to happen next was going to unify everyone who loved him. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for these elements of bread and juice. And for us as a church, Father, I'm so humbled to pastor such a great church of people who are together making a difference in this world, in the world. Not just in our backyard, which we're doing, but in the world. And we do it because we love you, but we couldn't do it if you didn't love us. And so, Father, we thank you for that. So bless these elements of bread and juice. Whatever is happening in the room, in anybody's life, I pray that they would not be defined by their circumstances, that they would just be defined by you. And we pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, the usher's going to come. If you're with us for the first time today, you're just going to take a piece of bread out of the basket and then dip it in the following goblet. If there are those of you who would like gluten-free, just when I'm done, hold up your hand and I'll come to you.
with joy shall fill my heart, then I shall running just a little bit late. I know every Sunday school teacher down that wall curr currently hates me. Um, but I want to show just a one minute video clip that was taken when we went to Israel. And we were actually in Jordan. We're standing on top of Mount Nebo. I sent this back home two years, three years ago now. Uh, but I just want to share this clip. I think it's going to be poignant to what we learned. Hello, today. Georgiana. We're standing on the top of Mount Nebo, the same place that Moses came and looked into the promised land and then was taken away and died. Can you imagine leading the people of Israel to this place? And because of disobedience and fear, he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Gosh, as I stand in this place and I look at a place that's flowing with milk and honey, the land of all the ites that we read about in the Bible, all I can think about is that I don't want anybody left behind. That I want us trusting the promises of this book so that we know that God has our future in his hands. And that if we will trust him, if we will walk with him, there will never be a day that he won't go before us. And so this place has been powerful as we come to the top of Mount Nebo to be reminded that God called it the promised land and that he promised to deliver his people and that we will not live in fear no matter what is coming our way. I love you and I can't wait to be back with you very soon. Shalom. Let me, let me share with you why that's so poignant. Um, we got to the Mount Nebo, and we did a devotion, and we had some time there. And I just stood there, and I, I just couldn't quit crying. I was just weeping and weeping. And Dee Dee comes up, and she always thinks the worst when that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why she's that way. And I, it took me a few minutes to get myself under control. Because I stood in the place where Moses had delivered a stiff-necked people, and some of them would not enter the promised land. Because they had been disobedient. They had been unfaithful. And my heart just broke to make sure nobody ever had that experience. That you would get to the finish line of your life. Know that the promised land is just ahead of you. And be kept out because you were disobedient. Because you were unfaithful. And thus, I refuse to let anybody come in and sow those seeds in this church. That would cause any number of you. To be able to stand in that place, it's the most powerful place I've ever stood. I thought, wow, Moses got to see that was his one gift from God, and then he was taken away. I just don't want that to happen for anybody. Amen? Amen. 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 Right, so know how much I love you. I know we're late. Please apologize to every Sunday school teacher in the hallway. <laughs> and to Kelly. Please apologize, Kelly. I love you. Have a great week. <laughs>